what I do in terms of my own research is I look at the workings of historical consciousness among key players uh, in the English-speaking community, and I've looked at community leaders and history teachers. So um, I'd like to extend a big warm thank you to the organizers of ILET's Forum on Minority Community Vitality. I think all of us can agree that it's it's a great success, and it's and so I'd like to thank specifically thank Lorraine O'Donnell and Patrick Donovan uh, of Questren. This wonderful event and coordinating it. So I know it involved a lot of work. I got so many emails. So. <laughs> so it's my great pleasure to have all of you here today for our town hall on changing attitudes and mindsets for reimagining English-speaking Quebec and making positive change. So the main purpose of today's event is really to bring academics and non-academics together to reflect on, exchange ideas, and grow together on issues that affect our everyday lives as Quebec citizens and as English speakers. At a general level, the purpose of the town hall is really to find ways to make change for improving our lives, the lives of our fellow community members, of our students if we are teachers, of our children if we are parents, of our friends, and of our fellow citizens. So I'll talk a little bit about today's theme. So since the 1970s, Quebec's language laws have come to institutionalize linguistic boundaries between the province's English and French speakers. And as a result, a new or young minority was created, English-speaking Quebec. Since then, issues of culture and identity that relate to language keep on standing out. And during politically charged moments are often used by politicians or others to harden attitudes between both groups. But what happened and this dichotomous relationship, I find, is that the needs and concerns of English-speaking Quebec's marginalized communities or subgroups tend to be pushed aside. In the same process, the legitimate needs and grievances of Quebec's indigenous populations are further silenced, uh, pointing to a non-recognition of ongoing settler colonial habits in the province. So based on these impasses, change in attitudes and mindsets seem to be very hard to come by, especially in helping to establish a more inclusive understanding of English-speaking Quebec. It is as if the ongoing feelings of threat and insecurity that tend to bring English speakers together seem to have the inadvertent effect of erasing nuanced differences and needs within the community. So in light of a perceived stronger and threatening other, it is as if differences within the community are pushed aside to bring everyone together on the basis of the group's main unifying marker, the English language. So the challenge for a lot of us in the room today, for community leaders and organizers, is to engage with individuals, or to engage individuals who self-identify as English-speaking and Quebecois in ways that are meaningful to them, but, to, that also foster, but that also foster feelings of commonality for their common situation as anglophones in the province. So this is hard because community leaders and organizers would have to find ways to address these subgroups' needs and grievances without necessarily imposing rigid forms of knowing and acting as English speakers. And this is even more harder because of today's generalized beliefs in multiple complex and fluid identities. So it's not that straightforward. So based on this overall theme, uh, the question that our panel from McGill University, <laughs> so I'm very happy to have my colleagues here today, uh, to address, uh, each of them will address the following question. How can we transform mindsets to embrace new attitudes and habits for positive change in light of the common good? So to do this, each of our panelists will talk for five to seven minutes, and uh, you will address two questions. Basically, based on today's theme, what is the problem? and how can we fix it? So the aim is to just share some ideas and to initiate discussion and to get you, right, members of the community, members of the audience, to join in and to share your experiences so that we can come and listen to each other and see what you have to say and share and expand our knowledge. So before we start, I'll just introduce our panelists. So uh, in alphabetical order, so we have John Cummins, who is a teacher of humanities for Nunavik Sivunit Sabut, and he's also a lecturer at McGill in the Department of Integrated Studies and Education. He's a course instructor for social studies teaching methods. 
Then we have, next to John, is uh, Janine Metallic, Assistant Professor in New Edition to our department, Assistant Professor in Indigenous Education, uh, who among other areas of interest focuses on indigenous research methodologies, uh, with a focus on indigenous ways of knowing and doing, as well as on indigenous language revitalization and maintenance. And then last but not least, we have Raman Lowe, Associate Professor in the area of Curriculum Studies, Literacy, and Pedagogy, with a specific focus on popular youth culture and the role that art can play in empowering students and giving them a sense of agency and direction in life. Thank you, Paul, for the introductions and for inviting me to be part of this session. I was really pleased to hear that we we're going to be having conversations, uh, conversations which render complex the idea that there's one English-speaking community in Quebec. Um, we, you know, we all know that there are many sub-communities within that larger community that may not even be a community. Um, and that uh, conversations which look at linguistic identity as shaped by race and social class and indigeneity are really important for having a more fuller portrait of some of the ways in which inclusion and exclusion operates. So I really wanted to take up the question, this topic of transforming mindsets, and do that by sharing some of the research I've had the pleasure of, of participating in over the last few years. Um, about six or seven years ago, I was deeply involved in a research project with two McGill colleagues that some of you know, Mela Sarkar and uh, Lise Weiner, and we were looking at the Montreal hip-hop community, and in particular, multilingual code shifting, and the ways in which using multiple languages was a marker of the Montreal style, reflecting a few things. Um, both the linguistic diversity of the communities that was producing this, uh, this music, but also a kind of cosmopolitan sensibility which really valued that, that linguistic diversity. Um, and even more generally, a kind of deep interest in questions around language and identity, which is, I think, particularly Quebec uh, preoccupation. And so it shaped the way in which these young people were living language um, and expressing their feelings about it through their art. And in a couple of articles, we made a case directed particularly at French language educators in Quebec <coughs> that, and as you're all familiar, there's often a pedagogical philosophy around French language learning in, in this province in which other languages are seen as threats to meeting the target language. And instead, we were arguing that these multilingual raps, which had French language base, but were very much celebrations of language more generally might be interesting pedagogical tools for fostering a sense of all of the available languages as sort of raw materials for create creative production and expression um, and for using these texts as ways to get at questions of language and identity which might I think kind of engage students in, in their own creative explorations and so that was one branch of work and so but I, I uh, but more recently, I've been working with a high school that a number of you will be familiar with, James Lane High School. I was part of a really interesting partnership called the Urban, Urban Arts Project. And it was a collection of academics from McGill's Faculty of Education, staff and teachers at James Lane, and it was initiated by the school, and then some community arts organizations um, tied to street art and hip hop culture. And Part of what we did, we built a recording studio in the school, we built an art gallery that's curated by students, but we also brought in artists to co-create and co-teach lessons across the curriculum. So there was this idea that since there had already been an interest in what we were calling the urban arts, let's you know, build on student success and integrate it uh, where possible. And in particular, we focused on French language instruction because we had heard from teachers and other staff members at that school that A, that French was a major barrier for graduation for those students, particularly the ministry exams, but also that <coughs> teachers were constantly <coughs> fighting against a, like a real reluctance to learn French, which was seen by a number of the students as something that was imposed upon them, that had been an, uh, create social inclusion in their communities and on their family, families, and including barriers to work and employment. And so they resisted French as something um, which, you know, as, as imposed upon them. And so we brought in some 
some rappers who worked with French as well as other languages to, to create units with a French teacher in which they were going to be writing rap lyrics and recording them in the studio. And uh, so, um, and really exploring some of this theory of language that we had found, um, and celebration of language that we had found in these rap texts. And I think that some of what we found you know, was, was quite promising. And it's something, you know, it's a very complex situation. It's a small school, and so the teachers would be teaching students who were native speakers with students who could speak hardly any French in the same classroom. So I mean, there's many structural limitations in French pedagogy there, but the idea that art and the tapping into the linguistic creativity, in this case of the, um, the rap community in Montreal, could help fight against some of those, those uh, effective barriers to learning French, I think has a lot of potential. Um, one, of the, one instance of that is that the students were brought to uh, the Fresh Paint Gallery to meet some street artists who were francophone and pushed themselves to speak French in the interest of communicating in ways that they might not have otherwise. And so um, part of the larger point I want to make here is that I think it's important that schools be as integrated as, as much as possible into wider communities. And some of those spaces that I have seen as the most linguistically open and generative and creative have been shaped by youth popular culture, which <coughs> is one of my research areas. So just to end here, um, I have been on the board of a youth center in Cote d'Ange, uh, the Maison des Jeunes that we're calling now Chanet Kent. I've been on the board for 12 years, and we have a really dynamic recording studio. It's called NBS, and young, young people come and rap in French and English and other languages. They are organically building video production programs, communications and uh, marketing programs built around their creative production. And this is all happening outside of ideas that this is French language instruction or English language instruction or who has access to it. Um, and they're, they're kind of, it's all sort of flying in the face of these categories that as adults we can be so, become so highly attached to. Um, and so I feel like if our classrooms could tap into some of those, that sort of spirit of linguistic play um, that is, it's so alive in some of these community-driven spaces. I think that would be, uh, a, you know, really helping this process of transforming mindsets. Thank you, Bronwyn. I'm going to take us in a, a very different direction. Um, <laughs> my name is John Cummins. I'm from NDG. I've been a high school history teacher for 30 years. Um, I currently teach at Nunavik Sibung Saudit and at McGill University. Tomorrow, Evie Mark, who's from the Nukchuak, will be coming to speak about Nunavik Sibu Salvin, as, as it should be. And uh, I'm grateful for her uh, to do that tomorrow. Also, I'd like to take this public occasion to thank Concordia University, because I came here as a mature student, as a 23-year-old. And uh, this institution welcomed me and uh, helped me dust myself off academically and, and get back to work in school. And uh, for that, I'm eternally appreciative of Concordia University as an institution. Thank you. I also teach at McGill University in the social studies methods. Um, I spent six years as a member of the Committee Elargie for the Quebec Ministry of Education. I selected amongst 14 teachers to uh, vet the previous reform social studies programs. I was the uh, only Anglophone of that group. So I'm going to speak from that perspective a little bit. Another thing with 30 years teaching is I'm old, all right? So I've seen a lot of different things. and. Uh, this has helped me provide an understanding that's evolved and changed over time to some extent. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to create a, a place and a space for debate. And I'd be happy to hear it. But it's not a polemic. I'm not seeking a polemic uh, or that position. Um, so let's read from this abstract. First, it says, mutual feelings of threat and insecurity continue to impact how Quebec's French and English language speaking communities view and communicate with each other. Needs and concerns of the community's marginalized subgroups seem to be particularly to be pushed aside. This process allows us to discuss how do we further silence as First Nations' own specific needs and legitimate grievances. This town hall has a, a transformed mindset to embrace new attitudes and habits for positive change in light of the common good. I agree with absolutely all of this, um, except this. 
I do not think we are in a space or a time where we can rely on the majority community to create a context for those voices to be heard, right? In any real significant way. I don't think that space really exists presently. My own experience tells me this process could change, could very possibly change. Um, but we're not even close right now to that place, to that reconciling of narratives as we speak. And I believe we have to be honest about that at this moment in time in 2018. Uh, when I was working in Quebec City uh, for, for those years, I met superb, engaged history teachers. I was blessed to be a part of that. I met historians who were absolutely first class and who saw the world through a prism that represented their community's interests in politics, which is perfectly understandable. Um, when talking about World War II, uh, when talking about who was the first urban proletariat in Quebec, the October crisis, the exodus of 300,000 people, we were often talking about utterly different things, um, which again was understandable. Focus and narrative were different. Totally different. In World War II, I would speak to the fact that I came from NDG, and every single father I knew served in World War II, including my own. When I'd have conversations with the other people around the table, that wasn't their experience from where they grew up at all. When looking at the October crisis from the perspective of me, growing up near Loyola College, founded and built by the Irish community, uh, a bomb was placed there in the midst of the FLQ terrorism time. This obviously provided me a very different perspective as an Irish Catholic from NDG. Um, and we could go on and on. We had great discussions. It was fantastic. But at the end of, at the end of it all, I recognized that, that we looked and had a different focus and narrative when talking about Quebec's past, which I think is legitimate. Um, however, one thing that's become more clear to me since uh, the new reform history package that the Parti Québécois ran on, they ran on the fact they would change the Canada-Quebec history program to be more nationalist, more politicized, and more speaking to what they considered important for Quebec's youth to be integrated into their historical consciousness. Um, I believe that's a problem for the English-speaking community. I believe that that narrative fed specifically through the University of Montréal School has become a narrative in which curriculum and culture are often driven. Um, and here's the real problem. The English-speaking community from which I'm from used to work as a perfect binary to that. That community no longer exists, right? Uh, and I believe that community will no longer accept that framing. Um, the idea that the voice of First Nations as subaltern is over, way over, okay, this is 2018. That space will no longer be occupied by members of the First Nations at all. Um, so here's where, where I stand. So what do we do? Uh, we do as the Inuit have done in Nunavik, Siwa, all right? Have done and are doing. We find partners. We find, we quit asking. We quit waiting, all right? We quit committing to opaque ministries' improvements. Um, we need to create our own programs and our own curriculums in Quebec amongst the English-speaking community. We have the capacity. We have three universities. We have education faculties. We have the population. Uh, the official commit language commissioner said that the history program is vital for cohesion and for an idea of a community's sense of self. Why can't we write our own? All right. Um, so, at the end of the day, I believe that the program that we teach our kids, English speakers, alienates them from this place, ultimately. And alienates them from the fact that they are full citizens that have helped build this space, that have helped create this space, like the one we are sitting in right now. Okay? Um, so, my message is simply this to the English speaking community in this context. It's simple. DYI. We can do it. We have the capacity. Look around this room. All right. We could create curriculum that would work for the benefit of our children. All right. Thank you. Okay. So to continue, uh, first of all, uh, I just want to introduce myself uh, and locate myself uh, in a more traditional way. So, Ningelwisi Jenny Metallic, Ningmomaj. Uh, Lusty Gujdlewi, Gespegawaki, 
Uh, Frank Metallic, in case you see Malian Metallic, would you go to Kevin, Glenn, Vicky, or Mark? I'm sitting in the I'm sitting in the Salty. Uh, in the Louis Sotier. Um, I gave Wiki and I had to look at Wiki University. Um, Paul mentioned in my introduction that I am a, a new hire at Wiki University and that my interest is in uh, indigenous language revitalization and indigenous methodologies. So this is how I introduce myself uh, by following the protocols and the methodologies of indigenous peoples, which is to first situate ourselves. And I like that. Um, we just heard uh, the importance of place because in my language and in my introduction, when I say Tlewi Lusigwich, it means I belong to Lusigwich. It's not just that I'm from there, but I belong to a place and I am indigenous to that place. I am a visitor here in Ganyanga uh, Haga territory or Haudenosaunee um, territory or Anishinaabe territory, depending on who you talk to. Uh, <laughs> it's all relative. Um, but being a visitor to this territory for the past 25 years, I realized that um, I need to continue um, locating myself be in this way because I am a visitor here uh, and, I, and I very much respect the indigenous peoples of this territory. Uh, so I grew up uh, speaking my own language. My parents thought it was very important at the time. Uh, they raised all of my siblings to speak the language. I also mentioned that in my introduction. Um, my parents raised us in the 70s and 80s at a time when most children were being integrated um, into public schools outside of the reserve. So even though I've lived in Quebec pretty much all my life, um, I went to public school in New Brunswick. So we were bused out of the community to attend public schools in either English or French, um, mostly French immersion. So my parents decided to send me to French immersion. They wanted their children to have those opportunities as, as any um, parent would want for their children. And so um, by the time I was six years old, I was learning three different languages at the same time. Uh, I tell people that I learned Mi'kmaq at home. It was our house policy to only speak Mi'kmaq, no English, no French. Um, my parents sent me to French immersion, so that's where I learned to speak French uh, from grades one through 12. And then I tell people that I learned English on the street um, Sesame Street, because <laughs> I've watched a lot of television. <laughs> um, and so this is how um, I learned all, the, all these different languages as I was growing up. Um, I'll get back to the story of my parents. Um, I just want to mention that my mother is also a language instructor in the community. She teaches the Mi'kmaq language to adults in the community, um, at this point mostly as a second language, because of different um, interruptions in the intergenerational transmission of our language. Uh, again, related to policies of assimilation and integration, federal government policies that affected our lives. Paul also mentioned that uh, I'm currently an assistant professor in Indigenous Education at McGill University. It's a brand new position. <laughs> uh, I just started on August 1st, 2018, so you can imagine the last uh, uh, <laughs> three months have been quite the um, quite the, uh, yeah, <laughs> a very steep learning curve and uh, uh, there's been a lot happening in the last three months. Um, so I teach a course called Indigenous Education and I can, I can attest to the fact that uh, what was just said about the uh, history curriculum and so on, one of the first things I ask students is um, their, question, their, their experiences or their knowledge about Indigenous peoples, uh, not only in Canada but in, in the Quebec area and even in the Montreal area, and most of them have, have very little knowledge of those um, different communities or populations, and they'll often say, well, we learned about the Algonquins and the Iroquois, and we learned that people lived in this kind of dwelling and this kind of dwelling, and they wore this kind of clothing and this kind of clothing, and this kind of food, and ate this kind of food and this kind of food, and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, so what I often do in class is I, I show them a map of uh, the Quebec region, uh, which illustrate, and I ask them, how many indigenous nations are there in Quebec? And then I often, if, you, if anyone wants to guess, <laughs> before I show them that. <laughs> 10? 11. 11? Okay, so, yeah. So we have, it's, it's a little bit of a trick question, but we have 10 First Nations plus the Inuit. So in total, 11 uh, indigenous nations, um, which make up, they're represented by over 50 different communities in, um, on this map. 
And what I wanted to um, illustrate to students is that oftentimes they're not aware of this history because it's not reflected in our curriculum, <coughs> um, at least not in Quebec. Um, so that's my current um, situation right now, teaching Indigenous education to pre-service teachers. Uh, it's opened my eyes to the situation of uh, not only Indigenous peoples, but also um, other things that were mentioned earlier um, in terms of um, Anglophone and Francophone uh, relationship as well. Um, my PhD research, uh, like I mentioned, was on Indigenous language revitalization. And my current research interest is also to continue along the lines of revitalizing indigenous languages. Uh, I'm currently supervising or co-supervising a, a Mi'kmaq PhD student who's also interested in that area. And I'm also um, on a committee for uh, a Mohawk PhD student. And so I'm expanding uh, this language development, uh, language revitalization work to include other nations within Quebec. And I hope to uh, work with other communities as well. So within this context of um, language loss, um, I think it's important to also talk about the status of indigenous languages. Um, in general, uh, if you look at languages across the country, we have, um, I believe, 60 different indigenous languages represented by 12 different linguistic families. So they're grouped according to families. <coughs> um, and I just came back this past weekend from the 50th Algonquian Conference, and uh, as part of that, uh, I did a presentation on my PhD work, and also highlighted the fact that we have um, eight different communities that are part of the Algonquian family. Um, but again, that knowledge isn't always uh, widely known, but we, I'm trying to promote that as <coughs> well. So I can see how language uh, preservation is a concern in Quebec, and often we have debates between Anglophone and Francophone. Um, but I just want to add that the future of indigenous languages are often not part of that conversation, and I believe they should be. Um, and as mentioned, indigenous languages are at various stages of uh, vitality or endangerment, depending on you know, if you want to look at positively or negatively. Uh, but they are severely or critically, uh, you know, at, at different stages of endangerment. 75% uh, are actually in that critical stage. Um, so the take home point I want to make, my last point, is just that the reality for indigenous peoples needs to be grounded in these discussions as well, um, and in the research and the policies related to language promo promotion, uh, preservation, and revitalization within Quebec and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. I'd like to thank all our panelists. I think you two have brought something very special and important to the discussion. And I find that um, both uh, John's and uh, Janine's perspective were a bit more radical than Bromwin's. So Bromwin, <laughs> so, so yeah, more of a Maxine Green kind of, you know, bringing in imagination and creativity and relying on youth popular culture, which is obvious, because the youth obviously sometimes see the world differently than, than adults do. And especially in Quebec in terms of the language binary that we, that we find ourselves with sometimes young people are moving beyond that based on discussions both informal and formal in terms of research. And then uh, John is a bit more radical and he wants to be honest and we can't rely on the majority group, we have to rely on ourselves because we have all the tools and resources and there's an argument to be made there too. So thank you for pointing that out. And then Janine also uh, is more radical in the sense that we want to raise awareness like indigenous communities have been excluded for such a long time. So the theme actually for this town hall came to my mind because I've been working on English speaking Quebec issues for over 10 years now. And I was young and I went to all the conferences and how many times have I heard Dorothy Williams and Clarence talk about raising awareness of black English speaking people's realities and needs and perspectives and they keep on singing the same chorus. And, and it's yes, like people are listening but they aren't listening. So maybe English speaking Quebec is held hostage to this idea of language identity politics, but at the same time, they need to get out of that binary to be more inclusive and to be able to like vitalize the community. So I'd like to thank all of you for um, bringing in your perspectives, and I'd like to open up the floor to see what everybody else has to say. Yes? This is for uh, John. I know I've, I've often thought about the idea too, or do we just write our own curriculum and give our students all the tools that we need. Um, 
And like the first question up there, does that not exasperate the, the two solitudes where the Francophone majority will go on believing what they want to believe, and the English, shall we say, have the truth. Um, but in light of what's going on today with, with the CAQ and the possibility of us having perhaps our own school boards and let the French school boards be dissolved, then maybe it is time for us to do something like that. Do you want me to speak? Yeah. Do you want to react? No, I, I, I just think that, look, at the idea, like Franco-Ontarians have agreed, uh, 12 cores uh, that speaks to their community. Um, I think that it could be done in a complementary fashion. There could be ways in which we could create a context where that curriculum it could be integrated, could be inclusive, uh, could be representative of our community, which is incredibly diverse. And, uh, and I think that's, that's the missing piece in all this. It's the idea that, that the English-speaking community is er everything but English. And we have a lot that we could contribute in terms of uh, creating context where um, I think that we would help our own community and possibly down the road when the majority community feels more, uh, less fragile, uh, then I think maybe there could be space in place to integrate those two. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Robert Talbot. I work for the Office of the Commissioner of Official Languages. I, I'm, uh, as you know, many people have English as their first official language uh, spoken uh, in uh, in Quebec. Our uh, our indigenous. How how can we make? Um, we talk a lot about community vitality how, uh, and uh, the vitality of the English speaking community of Quebec. How can how do we link the conversations around uh, the vitality of indigenous languages? with the vitality of the English-speaking community of Quebec. Thank you. You're right in pointing out that uh, the majority, I think, of uh, English-speaking uh, people in Quebec would come from the indigenous mm -hmm. communities. Uh, of the over 50 communities in the Quebec region, I, I think I counted about 35 that would have um, English as their other language in addition to um, their, their own uh, heritage language. And so uh, I feel that uh, that's a community to me that uh, represents a large uh, population. I also think it's important to point out that it's a very young population. In many of those communities, 50% uh, in most of those communities, 50% of the population is under the age of 25. So you can imagine, and it's and it's growing. <laughs> you know, people. You know, the, the families are growing. That youth uh, population is growing. And I think that um, that's an area where I think, like John was saying about building partnerships, I think there's huge potential there for building partnerships with indigenous communities around these areas of uh, promoting linguistic vitality and maybe multi multilingualism uh, to the point that um, I just want to, yeah, and that's another thing is that when I think about uh, the history that predates Quebec, <laughs> uh, we, we were multilingual, we had to be by necessity because our nations would interact with each other. And so the, through those interactions, we had to learn our neighbor's languages, our neighboring nations and for trade and so on. And so the idea of promoting multilingualism and, and, and forming allyships or partnerships with other communities is, is not really a new one. It's actually a very, very old one. And, but I think within the, the Quebec region is something that we can go back to. And I can explore uh, in, in, in more detail in an, uh, uh, maybe a new way, but uh, it's actually an old tradition <laughs> if, you, if you think about it. A question, comment first and then a question. Uh, uh, you, you've got two questions up there that seem to interrelate. I'm Michael Murray, excuse me, I'm Michael Murray from the Eastern Township School Board of the QESBA. Uh, it seems to me that. To redefine the Anglophone community in Quebec, we have to do things to pull it closer to the majority population, not tear it farther away. To shed the fortress mentality of people who come from and live in NDG, uh, not to name anybody, but uh, to, to get closer to the indigenous people's idea of multilingualism and, and collaboration, uh, because teaching kids who are 
self-defined as anglophone, a different anglophone history, is not going to help rapproche to bring together the French and English communities, nor is it going to improve the francophone understanding of the contribution of uh, indigenous people and anglophones to their history and to what is developed as modern day Quebec. So it seems to me that, that the approach is one of fortress mentality, but what I'm seeing is a very clear distinction between older people who have that kind of defensive reaction and the young people for whom language distinctions and distinctions of that nature are utterly irrelevant. The world is their oyster. They want to get out there and do things. They want to, they want to realize their own ambitions and not be stuck in these sterile debates of, of identity. Um, merci beaucoup, Mr. Murray. Uh, je suis loin de quelqu'un assiégé. Ma mère vient de la Suc, mon grand-père vient de Wendeke. Uh, je suis un membre d'une communauté des gens qui parlent anglais. Je ne suis pas un anglophone. Je n'accepte pas cette désignation. Jamais. Um, the idea that we're creating a fortress is not at all what I would like to do. I would like to create a context where our kids could feel they're a part of this place. And right now, they are profoundly alienated from this state because they are told in their history program they're studying the Quebec nation, a nation which apparently they're not a part of. So this to me is a systemic problem. And uh, it has nothing to do with me being an old, gray-haired, NDG anglophone, trust me. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much to all of you for all of your uh, your interventions, and I actually really like the fact that they were quite provocative. I think that's really, really great because I think sometimes we end up falling into these very sclerotic discussions, so I, I like the fact that there's a little bit of um, provoking coming out. And actually, I, I thought that Bronwyn did raise a, a, a point <laughs> that I would like to... <laughs> a little bit more radical than you. So the... the what you had said uh, is that there are many sub-communities in the English community that may not even be a community at all. And I think that there is real truth to that. I think it's something that we perhaps don't talk about enough. Um, and I think it's a tension that raises both challenges and opportunities for our discussions here. And I wonder if you, uh, any of you, all of you, could sort of talk about whether that, if, if you want to expand on that maybe a little bit, but also whether that, uh, that, um, that issue of, of is there a uniform English speaking community mm. and is it something that we can create you know create policy around uh, presently thank you <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I wanted to just say first of all that Michael the uh, I agree it's, you know I, I, do, I do wonder if these sorts of sh debates are somewhat generational um, and uh, so I, I see. I think John and I might have a slightly different perspective on that. But in in fact, so my response to that question of first the you know the is there an English speaking community and thinking about this in terms of generations. There was a question there about sort of older people and attitudes towards language and younger people. You know the I think it's really it's very complex because it really depends where you're, you know, what part of the island you're in, whether you're in francophone schools, which are populated with lots of anglophone, or kids who speak primarily English at home, like my children, or whether you're in some of the uh, English school boards with lots of allophones, you know, I mean, that it, I think it's hard to come up with one answer to that question around, um, around feelings of inclusion or not, and whether these things are shifting. Just to further complicate it, both I have two daughters who are both in uh, in French schools, and one has become almost like an English rights activist because she's so tired of being told not to speak English at school, um, and so it's kind of backfired, I must say, you know, in that in, in terms of our project of inclusion. Um, she also, that said, is at a very rigorous French school and is, you know, is in does very well in French, and so in terms of language learning, it's worked, but in terms of her feeling included, I think she, her sentiment really echoes a lot of what John is saying. She doesn't feel like she's part of, of the dominant majority because of the way in which her language use has been constantly policed at school. 
other daughter who's gone through the exact same educational trajectory, uh, has a very mixed group of friends. Some speak French at home, some speak other languages at home, some speak English at home. She's thinking about going to play above for C-Ship, whereas my other daughter can't wait to go to English she So it's very, you know, I think it's hard to come up with one answer to that question. I'd like to address uh, Celine's question of whether there is an English-speaking community, or if we can say that, that, that an English-speaking community exists. Um, I came across, I don't know if you know Adelaide Asma, she works on uh, cultural memory and collective memory, and she came up with this term of we groups. And we have multiple identities and we have multiple eyes, but each of our eyes are extensions of we groups that exist out in society. And I would argue that depending on time, place, and context, or depending on the political context that we're in right now, there's already a repertory of narrative scripts and images and metaphors or experiences that exist and that people can relate to and use and employ to uh, give meaning to one of their we groups as an extension of their many eyes. So uh, like that argument, I would say that English-speaking Quebec does exist because of the political context, because of the narrative scripts that exist, and because, that, but it doesn't have to be like a central eye, it could be a peripheral eye, but I would argue that English speaking effect does exist. Thank you. <laughs> I have the mic, so I'm gonna make a comment oh. too. Um, this debate about fortress versus, you know, forest boundaries, I think is um, not very fruitful, um, and other disciplines have already looked at this, and it would be good to to learn from other disciplines. My background is in women's history, and in all discussions, do we have separate women's history courses, or do we integrate women into the mainstream course, or do we rewrite the mainstream course to be? Um, we have to do all of it. I don't, I, it, it's simply not, we, we obviously need separate histories to document things that have been left out. We do, we need the stories, we need the, the resources, we need the inclusion in the textbooks. We also need inclusion in the, in the dominant narrative, and we need to rethink the dominant narrative. That is my point of view. Hi, uh, my name is Linda. I'm kind of new. Um, I think uh, this notion of inclusion is not to do with assimilation. So it strikes me that every single one of us however we may identify as being English speaking, is absolutely legitimate. We don't have to have a shared identity. That's not the main thing. What we have to understand is that we have a shared goal. And we can be as you know, diverse as, as, as we are indeed, and every single one of us is coming to this from a different perspective with a different context, and every single one of them is right. But we have a shared objective. And I think what we need to figure out is how we get to that whilst respecting each one of our individual approaches. Thank you. I have another question. Uh, a question about the, the, the narrative. Um, we've talked a lot about establishing um, the possibility of, of a narrative of the place of English-speaking Quebecers within Quebec society uh, to create a sense, to contribute to a sense of, of, um, of identity and belonging. Where um, in such a narrative uh, would Canada fit? Or what place for Canada in such a narrative of English-speaking Quebecers, their, their place or role or contribution to Canada, uh, and, uh, and vice versa? Thank you. Um, that's a, a really good question. I mean, as a constituent, simply, as simple as that, as a constituent, of Canada and of Quebec. Um, I don't think it would require more elaboration than that in terms of, course. like it wouldn't be a, a context for me, a history program, it would be nation building. It would be just to speak to our kids' stories. And they're so diverse and so rich. When you get into a classroom in Montreal uh, and just speak to kids about their family's history, the immigration experience, war ones, two, the depression, decolonization movements, etc. Uh, your program is written for you, your history program, because you're going to speak to them first and then broaden it. Uh, in terms of your question, I don't know if I'm, I'm leading in the direction you'd like, but I, I, Canada is a reality. So it's, sorry. Just, just to follow up on that response, is it more, is it 
English-speaking Quebecers who happen to live in a state, happen to live in Canada kind of interpretation, or is it, pardon me? Yeah. What about if, if not so much on, um, and the commissioner alluded to it a bit uh, yesterday, but not so much about nation building, but the role that, um, that English-speaking Quebecers have played as, as bridge builders, as uh, interlocutors between um, of the English majority and the French majority, or uh, in, we think of a uh, narrative for, for English speaking Quebec women have played a critical role in advancing women's rights in, in Canada as a whole. Matthew Kuhncombe was a, a tremendous leader in advancing Indigenous rights uh, in, in uh, across Canada. People like uh, uh, Frank Scott uh, you know, were, were critical to, to the BNB Commission. Um, where, like this is F.R. Scott, is one of my personal heroes, Matthew Kuhncombe. Far Scott and Dunham, the city of Dunham in the Eastern Townships was one of the central places for women's rights to be discussed and promoted. Where are they in Quebec's history curriculum? Yeah. Or in, I, in, in Quebec's history curriculum, but I think I, I, I'm speaking to this as, as uh, an, uh, an English speaking uh, Saskatchewanian <laughs> of origin. And so where, where there's very little knowledge or awareness of the, the place of English speaking Quebecers and of the, 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 the critical. Often played, so I think to be uh, to be upfront, that's sort of where my interest and my curiosity uh, in this comes from. I think I've I've used up enough. I think more than my allocation of time. So thank you. Um, did anybody want to share their own experiences or ideas and in, 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 in developing ways to kind of overcome Prishab? Yes. Prishab. <laughs> I guess, uh, Richard, I guess now it's time to psychoanalyze the francophone <laughs> dominant majority because we're talking about the francophone dominant majority. That's the elephant in the room. Okay. So they're there. Uh, so uh, sometimes I feel that francophones are a, a dominant majority with the mentality of a threatened minority. So in, when, with that mindset, we, we see uh, uh, others as being uh, suspect minorities that can dilute uh, whatever it is that we are as a national majority on the Quebec territory. Now, if the Quebecois francophones give up uh, their narrative of uh, defining themselves, well, I mean, if, if uh, uh, francophones would take up the idea that they, are a, they admit that they are a dominant majority, it would mean that they would have to start seeing minorities as a responsibility, or at least as minorities you have to somewhat take care of or not abuse. But it's very difficult for francophone uh, dominant majority to admit that that's what they are, because the whole nationalist discourse was based on being a threatened or fragile majority within Quebec. So it's like a, a, a an, an impasse, you know, a psychological impasse. And I'm not sure yet what it will take to break that uh, mindset. And it's a, it, it's a force of inertia in the system, which then forces all minorities to have it, to define themselves uh, is that that dominant majority. Yes, the idea of powerful communist frames, right, that are hard to complicate, and, and that's what teachers try to do like in history classrooms. And that was what Janine was trying to do, trying to kind of see what, what, what people you're engaging with know and then kind of pick out like, like the misinformation, the misperceptions, and then to try to kind of complicate that. But that's really, really hard to do. And I think someone mentioned earlier on, like no matter, I think it was wrong, but like, 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 like no matter how hard you try to introduce people to different perspectives, it could just reinforce, right, the whole idea of uh, confirmation bias could reinforce your own perspective. So it is it is complex, it is hard. Uh, and I think Usman wanted to say something. Usman Jamil, Yale University. So I agree with the uh, um, gentleman up, up here. I would actually maybe just add that I think what we're talking about is a form of white privilege here in Quebec, um, which is based around language and the racialization of language and French identity in that sense. And thinking about it in other contexts, uh, so the thing with white privilege is that it's not our problem, right? Uh, in the sense that challenging white privilege um, involves the work of uh, people who are anti-racist educators, whatever. But they don't wait for white privilege to recognize that they're that they have the privilege, right? They they 
focus on critiquing and dismantling and, and you know bringing other tools to the to the table. So I argue that you know we can do thinking thinking about the situation as a parallel. I think the same options are available to us here in Quebec. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, one of the senior uh, ministers in the Quiar uh, cabinet came to uh, the Udawe and uh, I brought to the minister's attention that 60% of the people in the Pontiac area were Anglophones. And the question was, where did they all come from? And the answer to that is they've been there since the 1800s. And uh, I think that there is a, a change in the mindset. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, I was the executive director of the Regional Association of West Quebecers, and I had a, a group of senior citizens who approached me and said, you know, we're tired. We, we, when we go grocery shopping, we want to be able to read the signs and understand them so that um, the um, regional association has received funding from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and they are giving free courses in French to Anglophones, Anglophones who are not immigrants, well some might be, but who are born and raised in um, Quebec. And uh, of the 60,000 Anglophones that live in the Western Quebec region, uh, less than half of them consider themselves bilingual. But there is a, a mind change so that the last I heard, there are hundreds of people on the waiting list to take these courses, and the courses are being offered in Elmer, in Wakefield, and in Shawville, um, so that uh, I think that there are many Anglophones who want to become more a part of the Quebecois culture. And um, so that I think that, uh, you know, the Western Quebec is heading in the right direction. And, um, you know, I would hope that more Anglophones, if that program extends elsewhere in the province, that they would take uh, advantage of these courses and uh, improve their French. Hi, my name is Nina Kim and I'm from uh, CBEC. Just taking a completely uh, different approach <laughs> compared to what we've been speaking about right now. Um, my perspective is that taking a positive approach is much more invigorating um, than taking a deficit-based approach. So I'm going to use an example from my eight-year-old daughter when she was, she's no longer eight, but when she was seven or eight, um, in elementary school, and it really illustrates a really positive solutions-based approach. There was a new boy who came uh, from Portugal at the time who could no longer speak, or he could not speak yet, English or French, and um, they're in a current, they're in a French immersion school system. My daughter would speak to him in Spanish in order for him to speak back in Portuguese so she could translate what this teacher who's speaking in French was saying to the class so he could follow the instructional design. What I took from this is that I think we can really leverage multilingualism to bridge the two solitudes. It's not that it's going against us. There's a love of learning in language. There's a love of culture in language, the richness in it. One language doesn't translate to another, so it doesn't mean that you're lacking, but by adding to your language repertoire, you're able to verbalize and articulate different ideas in different ways. And as children, they have the best way of just not seeing any barriers um, in language and people. And so I think just by promoting the love of language and the love of learning, we can really um, actually use it to bridge the French and English divide here in the province. So that speaks to Romans. Uh, yeah, comments. Very interesting. Oh, I just have one last question for Romans, because um, I would love to, I don't know if you want to answer this question, but, but I'd love to hear what your response would be to both Jane and John's uh, interventions. But not in terms of how you would bring what you said in terms of proper youth culture and how that would kind of bridge any gaps or, you know, like I understand where John's coming from because like he's, it's based on experience and also like those powerful cognitive frames that Hesha was talking about and, and then just that, that, that whole like, majority of the minority mindset and sometimes you can't, you know, counter that. So then 
John is saying, you just kind of focus on yourself, which is kind of what Janine's message is also. So like this sense of self-empowerment, but your approach is quite interesting. So would, would, so how would you kind of infuse, you know, like author, like your approach regarding popular youth culture or the arts-based approach into what, any spontaneous thoughts? Like nothing? Does, does that make sense? Certainly, I think a lot of the um, most vital indigenous resurgence for concluding around language revitalization is coming from the indigenous hip hop scene, um, indigenous music scene in general across the country, but also in um, <coughs> So, um, I think Geneva is very aware of this, and um, I think it is. Uh, and I think every school should have a recording studio, really do. I'm seeing it's such an amazing space for cross-curricular work and um, as a place to really celebrate multilingualism and language and, and self-expression and identity. And in terms of, I'm um, not quite a clear question you're asking me in terms of um, you know, how pop culture might help the English community. Well, it, it's in relation to uh, um, the, the idea of multilingualism and, and how you were saying rap, bringing French rappers and, and to create music with English speaking youth kind of helped, you know, open up creative spaces for creativity and, and new ways of thinking. And I'm just wondering um, if you had any thoughts in terms of, because uh, I like I disagree that what John is presenting is not a fortress mentality, it's like, like there's something else to it and I understand where. So I'm just wondering if, if you understood what he was saying and whether it may be <laughs> back to the recording. Back to the recording. Yeah, back to the recording. School, and I, I think you know we all know that storytelling is vital to being human, and so creating spaces where people feel free not only to learn the stories from their own communities, but also to express them and to play with them and to invent new narratives for themselves in those communities is really important. And I think when schools do that well, it's you know, everybody benefits. So the takeaway is we know what the situation is. Thanks to what we shot gave us some great interesting context. And then one solution would be the youth, right? And, and the younger generation. So maybe we could kind of focus on on kind of finding ways to overcome certain mindsets that are really, really hard to crack because of the way we've been socialized, because of, of emotions, because of, 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 of the politics and, and, and the memories of oppression, etc. So um, yeah, I'd like to thank all of us I'd like to thank all our panelists <laughs> and our audience members, and I guess I'd like to thank myself.